is Science Max. Experiments at large. Science Max! Oh, hi, Science Maximites. Have you ever been eating pasta and wondered, what could I build with this? Could I build something that could hold an impressive amount of weight? Well, I have. And that's what we're gonna do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. But we're not gonna use cooked pasta because it's too delicious. We're gonna use uncooked pasta. Which is less delicious, but it's great for building. We're gonna make a pasta bridge. Here's how you do it. First, you wanna start with a plan. And then you wanna take your pasta. I'm saying pasta, but of course, spaghetti is usually the best thing to use. And lay it out on your plan. The reason you have a plan is so that you can make sure all of the spaghetti is exactly the right length. Lay it out on your plan, perfectly aligned like that. There, and now it's time to glue it all together. Now you can use white glue, but it takes a long time. So I suggest a hot glue gun, but make sure you get an adult's permission before you use one of these, okay? So you take your plan, you lay it out, you glue it up, don't glue it on the paper because that will be bad, and you will end up with your truss. And it looks just like this. Now remember, you want two sides because those are the sides of your bridge. And as you can see, I've used several strands of pasta because that'll make it a little bit stronger. Once you have your trusses, it's time for the next part of the plan. This is the roadway, and it works the same way. Lay out your pasta, glue it up, and bam, there it is. Now, you put your trusses on your roadway, and you glue them all together, and you also wanna put some struts along the top here, probably, to keep it nice and rigid. In the end, you will end up with a fantastic-looking pasta bridge. Pretty good, huh? No! Pasta bridge. No other bridge could claim to be 100% pasta, minus the glue. 99.8% pasta. 0.2% glue. I say there, Captain. Set sail. Set sail for the land of pasta bridges. Now, if that was pretty fast for you, don't worry. All the instructions are going to be on our website. Now, a bridge isn't a bridge unless it spans a gap, because that's what bridges are for. So you put your pasta bridge up there, across the books like that, and then you can see just how much weight the bridge holds. It's pretty impressive. If you build it right, even something as flimsy and as delicate as pasta can hold quite a bit of weight. I like to use big, heavy blocks and put them in the middle where there is no support from the books whatsoever and just keep adding heavy things and see how much weight the bridge will hold before it breaks. How much will it hold? Well, I'm not gonna tell you. That's where you get to be science maximites and find out for yourselves. And now, we're gonna max it out. Today on, oh, my pasta. Today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we're gonna be looking at how fragile things can become strong if you build them right. Uh, we're also gonna be maxing out the pasta bridge experiment to see if we can make one that's strong enough to hold me. You think we can do it? I know I have no idea, but I'm going to the Center for Skills Development and Training to find out. Oh, hey, Kyle. Phil. How you doing? Great, thanks. Awesome. This is Kyle. He's got a master's in civil engineering. Uh, did you want some pasta? I'm good. I can go back and get some more. Really, I'm good. OK. So what does a civil engineer do? Well, a civil engineer builds the world around us. Talk about our homes keeping us warm in the winter, our roads, hey, even our bridges. Bridges, that's fantastic, because that's what I need your help with. I want to max out the pasta bridge. Awesome. I want to make one big enough that I can walk across it. OK, that's never been done before. I know, right? You think we can do it? We're going to need a lot of help to do that. Uh, we don't need help. All we need is a lot of pasta, which I have. Ha <laughs> ha. Nice. What do you say? Yeah, let's give it a shot. Okay, we'll give it a shot. I'll, why don't we just take some to start, and then... In order to max out our pasta bridge, the idea is to take many, many strands of pasta and just keep gluing them together so the long beams of pasta in our giant bridge is nothing but many, many regular-sized strands of pasta. Here's where we were after 20 minutes of gluing. There, that's nice. Yeah, I... I... I think this piece is done. OK. So how does it work? Is it, is it strong? Whoa. Well, let's give it a go, eh? 
Yeah, I think this will hold. Great. So we just need to build a few more of these then, right? Yeah, that's right. How many more? 212 more. 212 of these. More. 212, that's, but it took us like 20 minutes to make this one. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess so. I mean, this is Science Max Experiments at Large. That's what we do. We just keep building and building, and, you know, I don't have any plans for the next while, so we can... Uh, F Phil, yep. I think that there's a better way of doing this. I would be delighted to know there's a better way. It'd be faster than this. Much faster. Sure, let's do it. Awesome. I'm just gonna put the pasta back in the bag because it, it, F it, it'll Phil, get you, stale. You don't have to do that. No, no, but it'll get stale. Phil, okay. I'm gonna call in one of my friends. We're probably gonna need some more help with this. Oh, man, that's a great idea. Sorry, that's a great idea, because it's, it's, it, there's, yeah, because at least we could get your friend to help clean up. Better sandcastles in 80 seconds. Building sandcastles is fun, but you can't use dry sand, because it doesn't stay up very well. You have to use wet sand. But even if you use wet sand, it doesn't hold a lot of weight. But if you use sand with the power of science, it does hold the weight. Dry sand, wet sand, science sand. Here's what's going on. Say these ping pong balls are grains of sand. When they're dry, they don't hold together very well. That's why you can't build a sandcastle out of dry sand. But if you get the sand wet a little bit, the grains of sand will hold together a little better because of the surface tension of the water. That's why it's easier to build a sandcastle with wet sand, but they still won't hold much weight. But if you add something that creates even more friction between the grains of sand, like say, this sandpaper, it will hold the weight. So here's what you do. Take window screen and cut it into circles. Make sure you get an adult's permission first, okay? Deal? Put in a layer of sand, pack it down, and put in a circle of window screen. And a layer of sand, pack it down, circle of window screen. Then, you guessed it, layer of sand, pack it down, circle of window screen. The window screens are gonna add more friction between the grains of sand and will make your sand castle strong. Strong with the power of science. And then uh, you can put lots of weight on it. And there you go. Sand with the power of science. <laughs> okay, I had to max it out. Let's see how strong science sand really is. Huh? Ha 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 ha! Our pasta bridge was going to take a long time to build out of individual pieces. So we have a new plan. Hey, Michaela. Hey, Phil. How you doing? I'm great, how are you? Good, this is Michaela. She's an undergrad in industrial engineering, right? I am. And you and Kyle have a new plan for how we can build our pasta bridge that's not gonna look oh, like this. Oh, man. This is the best that Kyle and I could do with 20 minutes. Okay, well, I have better. Good, I'm glad. How are we gonna do it? So instead of that, we're gonna try something like this. Oh, okay. This is sort of like a giant burrito kind of thing, right? Yep. But we're going to build the bridge out of this. Exactly. Uh, we're gonna make it longer, though? Yep, we're gonna make it eight feet long. We have this long pole, right? Yep. And we have sheets of this pasta. We're gonna put them on the diagonal. Okay. And we're gonna roll it, mm -hmm. but we're gonna start from this corner, and we're gonna keep rolling. And don't All forget right. to add water. And we gotta add water. I'll add because, the water. Okay. Adding water, just Yay. like this. Yep helps the pasta to stick together. So as we're rolling, we're rolling, we're rolling. We're gonna keep doing this with a bunch more sheets so that it gets really, really long, like eight feet long. And when we're finally done rolling, we gotta spray it with some varnish. Yep. And so it all holds together. Great, and then it's gonna be about this thick. Yeah. When we're finished with it. Exactly. This is gonna be one of the parts of the deck of our bridge. Great, so each one of these large pieces is gonna be like one single strand of pasta and the little bridge will be. Yeah. We need a lot of these. A lot. A lot. Yeah. Still, it's a lot faster than doing it piece by piece with just the oh. spaghetti. Every time I hold it up, you make that noise. Oh. 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 <laughs> awesome.
The shape of something makes a big difference in how strong it is. Get some toilet paper rolls and put them in a square and then stack books on top of them. They can hold, wait, thing is, they can actually hold a lot more weight than you probably think. In fact, the amount of weight, just paper in a tube can hold is really kind of impressive. And now, woo, let's max it out. Fills weight on two toilet paper rolls. Nope, fills weight on four toilet paper rolls. Nope. Bill's weight on six toilet paper rolls. Nope. Bill's weight on ten toilet paper rolls. Ha! Ha ha! Phil's weight can be supported by 10 toilet paper rolls. But what if Phil jumps? Ha 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 Didn't really work. So, Kyle and Michaela's plan is to use a long pole and sheets of uncooked pasta. We roll the pasta around the pole and spray it with a little varnish. We roll sheets and sheets of pasta along an eight foot long pole, making many layers of pasta. Then we wait for it to dry and remove the pole. What we have is an eight foot long hollow tube of pasta that becomes a single piece of the bridge. Then we attach a bunch of these pieces together and use more sheets of pasta to glue them into the shape we used for our small pasta bridge. We're making our giant pasta bridge by wrapping sheets of pasta around and around the poles using the technique we just had, <sighs> making a whole large pole out of many, many, many sheets of pasta rolled around each other. And we've made a giant truss. Look at this, this is great, guys. It's looking pretty good. Yeah, if I hit it, you think it'd stay together? No, oh, yeah, stop. Yeah, yeah. What? This is pasta, not steel. It's only made to just hold you. Kyle, what do you think are the chances that this is gonna hold me when we build it? Something like 50-50. Not bad. Michaela, what do you think? I'm gonna hold for the best. Hoping for the best. That's exactly the kind of gray area we like to work in at Science Max Experiments at Large. Experiments at Large, I don't know if anybody's even ever done this before. Not to my knowledge. Which is, I don't think so. Which is why we have no idea if it's going to work. Okay, so uh, one more of these, because these are the sides. Yep. yep. Uh, roadway, and then the top. Yep. Yep. All right, let's do it. While we're waiting, it's a good moment to point out one of the things that makes our bridge really strong. That is triangles. As you can see, the truss, or the side of our bridge, is really just three big triangles. Triangles are very strong shapes to build with, and they work great in bridges. Now it's time for science so simple, a caveman could do it. This is a caveman. Today we are going to teach this caveman how to build a strong structure. Here are some boxes. Go on and build a shelter, and I'll come back and see how it worked out. No, 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 that's not right. You need to build walls by stacking boxes on top of each other. That's how you build. Understand? Oh, yeah! I'll come back later and see how it worked out. 
Uh-oh. Does that look right to you? Yeah? Look at those boxes. They're stacked on top of each other. Yeah. But if they are in tall stacks, what would happen if you push on the wall? Oh. You see? Walls don't stay up if you build like that. Let's try again. I'll help you this time. First, lay out the foundation. Where your wall should go. Good. Now let's make the second level. No, no. Don't put it right on top. You need to stack in between. That's how you make a strong wall. Okay. I'll come back later. Nice work. Why don't you give it a try? Looks strong. But you forgot a box. Join us next time when we talk about how to make a door. Building a door in a wall is hard because how do you make a big gaping hole in your wall without your wall falling over? Well, people have come up with lots of ways to put doors and windows in walls made of stone blocks over the centuries. And you can do this at home with books like I'm doing or with building blocks. Just go up until you're happy with the height and then stack each next layer a little closer to the middle until the final layer touches just like this. And then you take a big heavy book and you drop it right on top. And it's pretty stable. And you've just made a doorway. It works even better if it's part of a wall because you want extra weight on the outside of these books here. So of course, I had to build one that was part of a whole wall. This is the same corbelled arch built out of little building blocks. And as you can see, I went closer and closer together until it meets at the top, and it is very strong. Whoa. Ha-ha! Now, let's max it out. The kind of arch we're building is a corbelled arch. And the Science Max build team and I are using pieces of wood cut to different lengths. How high can it go? We can use my head to, no, okay, wait, wait. It takes a while to get together, but once it's done, it looks just like the kinds of doorways stone buildings had in ancient times. Ta-da, there you go, a maxed out corbelled arch. We went straight up until we got to these layers and they got a little bit closer and closer to the middle until the last piece is one big solid piece. And if we built this right, it should be strong enough to hold me up. Science! Well, it held me up for a minute, didn't it? We rolled our pasta and constructed one truss. Now we've made a lot more rolls of pasta and connected them all together to make a second truss and a roadway, as well as the cross braces on top. And when we get it all together, we end up with... Whoa, pasta bridge! Pasta bridge! <laughs> we did it! We built it. We have no idea how long it will stay up. But it's up. It's doing its bridge thing for now, anyway. I am very excited because, as far as we know, I'm the only one to try to cross a bridge made out of pasta. What do you guys think? I think I don't want you to be the last person to cross a pasta bridge. You're absolutely right. But I, I'm gonna do it. I think, I think we're ready. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Ah! Oh, oh, oh no! That doesn't bode well for our pasta bridge. What what happened here, Kyle? You put all your weight in the middle of the joist. It snapped. Uh huh. If only there was a way to distribute your weight. Maybe if you crawled. Do like the military style kind of. Oh right, so that I'm putting my weight on more than one spot. Yeah exactly. yeah. Exactly. Oh, wait a minute. That gives me an idea. You guys stay right there. I, have, I, I, I know okay. what to do. I know okay. what to do. I know what to do. You're coming back, right? Skis distribute your weight over a large area so you don't sink in the snow. That's what skis do, which is perfect for the pasta bridge. <laughs> Come on. Uh, okay. Okay. Here come we go. on. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh-huh. Is it working? Yeah. It's working. I hear some cracking. This might oh, do no. it. Uh-huh. Try to, try to spread your legs apart. Spreading Distribute my legs weight. apart. Distribute your weight. Distributing my weight. It's swaying a lot. Oh, man. Oh. Whoa. Oh. There you go, science max, experiments at large, pasta bridge, skis, what more could you want? Maybe a pasta chairlift of some sort. <laughs> Greetings, science maximites. I am Phil McCordick, and this is science max, experiments at large. Today, we're going to be experimenting with the balloon powered car. Here's how it works. <laughs> Woohoo! It all has to do with Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, we don't we don't have to do this now. We can this is all for later. We can build the cars first and then we can uh let's go over here. So how do you build a balloon-powered car? Well, I suggest you be science maximites because there's any number of ways you can build a balloon-powered car. You do not have to follow my design. You should come up with one of your own. It may even be better than the one I built. But I will give you some tips, though, that make it a lot easier. First of all, you need something to stick your balloon on that has an opening on it. I used a turkey baster for this car. I just pop the top off and remember to tell an adult that you're using the turkey baster. And then you stick the balloon on there, and it allows you to attach something to the car, and it also makes it easier to blow up the balloon. <laughs> you can use any number of things, even just uh, any kind of tube that you find lying around. It helps you attach the balloon to the car, and it helps you blow up the balloon way easier. The other thing you should think about when you make your balloon-powered car is how you're going to make the wheels roll. Once you've decided on the base of the car, you could use anything, even just a piece of cardboard like this, you can do your wheels in two ways. The first way is to attach the wheels to the axle. This is how I made the axle of this car. I used a shish kebab skewer and I stuck it inside a straw, just like that. And then I attached the lids to the shish kebab skewer. So the lids and the shish kebab skewer are attached and they rotate in the straw. That's one way to make the wheels turn. The other way is to tape down the axle or whatever you're going to use uh, and have the wheels spin around on the axle. Two great ways to make your wheels turn and it really kind of depends on the wheels you're using. You can make your own design and keep refining it and making it better and faster or do what I like to do and make a whole bunch of different cars. So we've got this one. Duh. This one I made out of paper plates, and this is a snorkel. Awesome. This one is the rock car, because there's a rock on it. I've got uh, a dragster model. It's a long broom handle, and it might not work that well, but who, who knows? And this is my favorite design. It's made out of waffles and an ice cube tray. This is why I make a whole bunch of different cars, because I can race them. Sunday, 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 at the Science Maxadrome. It's the balloon-powered car winner-take-all drag race of awesome. First up, the Eliminator. <laughs> Woohoo! Better late than never, it's the Procrastinator. <laughs> Crushing the competition, it's the Terminator! <laughs> Feel the chill of the refrigerator! And last but not least, the um, regurgitator. <sighs> well, when you build your balloon powered cars, you can figure out what worked or uh, what didn't work and try modifying your designs to make them work even better. That is science.
And now we're gonna max it out because this is Science Max Experiments at Large. So we're gonna take that small balloon powered car that we just built and we're gonna make it much, much bigger. I'm gonna go to the Center for Skills Development and Training and we're gonna use the science behind the small balloon powered car and we're gonna make it big. That science is Newton's third law. But there's Newton's plenty of third law. No, there's, for every action, there's, there's, there's plenty of time for this later. We're not doing action. we're not doing this bit now. We're doing that bit in a minute. So we could wait, wait, no, I, I said we're doing it later. We're doing it later. <sighs> Whoa. Uh, hi, Sarah. Hi, Phil. This is Sarah, and she's got a master's degree in physics from McMaster University. That's right. And we're going to be talking about Newton's third law. Ooh, look out, look out, duck. Uh, sorry, sorry. There was a sign that kept coming in. Um, never mind. Newton's third law. Well, what is that? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right. So how does that work with our balloon car? Ah, cool. OK, so if you blow up the balloon, What's going to happen when you release it is the air is going to push out with a certain force, which in turn is going to cause the cart to move forward with the exact same force. Yeah, works great. So how come it doesn't work with my rock cart? Ah, wow. Well, actually, it did work. So the balloon still pushes with the exact same force, which causes the cart to have the exact same force push forward. But your rock is really heavy, so you probably didn't see it move. Oh, so a lighter cart works better with the same amount of force. That's it. Well, there you go. Newton's third law. What? Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. I'm really starting to dislike that sign. Phil, are you OK? Yeah, I'm fine. Our small balloon-powered car works because of Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The air pushing out the balloon this way pushes the car with the same amount of force this way. So, in order to max it out, the plan is just to get a bigger wheeled cart and a much bigger balloon. So, everything should work out the same. Okay, so, sorry. Oh, I thought what we would do is I would, in order to max out the balloon powered car, what we need is a cart to start with and then I ride it, and we have a giant balloon, and then I go. Do you have a giant balloon? Ha, 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 Giant balloon! So, step one, uh, Sarah blows up the balloon. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Use this air compressor, it'll probably be a lot faster. Sarah and I get to work blowing up the balloon, and it takes a long time. A very long time. Okay, human-sized balloon-powered car test. Take one. All right, Sarah. You got it? Yeah. Okay, let it go. Okay, go, go. Let it go. <laughs> I and did. You didn't let it go. I just let go. Nothing is happening. It's not coming out fast enough, and you're a bit too massive. I don't think it's gonna work like this. Really? Yeah. Okay, uh, balloon powered car test two. No fill. I'll just take it and... Ah! What happened? Uh, I don't think it worked. The balloon popped. Phil, are you okay? This is why you wear protective eyewear. Uh, yeah. So, that didn't work? No. No. Should we get another balloon? Uh... I think uh, we need something else. OK, well, the air coming out of the balloon just what, didn't have enough force, so. We need the air to come out with more force. Yeah, do we get, what, a bigger a bigger balloon? I don't think that's going to work. I don't think it's that. I think we need something with compressed air. Oh, like a scuba tank or a? Fire extinguisher, something like that. Yeah, that, that's what we need. OK, sure. Well, we can, all right, so I don't know if that's safe to do that. So we'd have to build, a, like, a cage or yeah, something? Yeah, I don't know if it's going to work on this. All right, well, back. Back to the drawing board. So okay. what we should do is we should get up. We need a, to find these tanks. Get the tanks, and then we make a, like a frame out of aluminum or something. OK, that could work. Yeah, That's they can hold idea. the tanks, so yeah. they're safe. And then what we should do is. Who was Isaac Newton? He was a mathematician and probably number one on the list of top scientists of all time. Albert Einstein said, Isaac Newton was the smartest person that ever lived. You've got to be special if Einstein is calling you smart.
Newton's three laws of motion was a huge idea. But did you know Newton also came up with the idea of gravity? The famous story is that in 1666, Isaac Newton was sitting under an apple tree when he watched an apple fall and wondered why. Hey everyone, I just invented gravity, which was a big relief because up until then, everyone was just floating around. Okay, so it didn't happen like that. He didn't invent gravity. He gave a name to this invisible force and then described how it works. Not only did it make things fall down, but it was the same force that kept the moon circling the Earth and the Earth circling the sun. And he invented a new kind of math to explain how. We now call it calculus. See, I told you he was smart. He's very smart. This is hydrophobic coating. Hydrophobic literally means afraid of water, but it's not actually afraid of water. The chemistry of a hydrophobic coating prevents water molecules from penetrating anything you spray it on. You can get this stuff at the hardware store, and if you want, be science maximites and get an adult and think of the coolest thing you could spray with hydrophobic coating. I like to use things that do not go well when you put them in water, like uh, tissue. Yeah, doesn't look great when it gets wet. Here's a tissue coated in hydrophobic coating. Huh? Weird. Or it works the same with a paper towel. Paper towel in water, paper towel covered in hydrophobic coating, stays dry. Or how about a dinner roll? Dinner rolls really don't like water. See? Gross. But a dinner roll coated in hydrophobic coating? Weird. Just don't eat it. Now, it's time to max it out. I have coated half of my lab coat in hydrophobic coating, and the other half, I have not. Hydrophobic coating, regular lab coat. Half of me is wet, and half of me is dry. What's more, half of my outfit ended up being wet and half dry because the lab coat was protecting my outfit from getting wet. Now it's time to max it out even more. We have coated my entire outfit in hydrophobic spray. My shirt, my pants, and my lab coat. The pants have been taped to rubber boots, so no water's getting in there. And my shirt has been taped to my pants, so no water's getting in there. So here's the question. Can I get into the pool and out of the pool and stay dry? Let's find out. In the pool, out of the pool, and I'm still mostly dry. <laughs> now here's what really happened. I got into the pool, and I realized I should have duct taped the pocket, because all the water went in there, down into the rubber boots, started filling up the rubber boots, and now my entire leg is full of water because the hydrophobic coating isn't letting it come out. So the hydrophobic coating isn't keeping the water out, now it's keeping the water in. Let's take a closer look at Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. OK. All right, let's watch it back. When the sign hits me, I exert a force on the sign in the opposite direction. That makes the sign stop moving. It also exerts an equal force on me, causing me to fly off in this direction. Now, if I was to push this sign, I'm not only pushing the sign this way, but my feet are pushing against the ground in the opposite direction. It's, um, well, it's really easier to see if I'm not standing on the ground. Um, oh, hold on. Okay, so, huh? Oh, okay. So now that I'm hanging, watch, I push on the sign, but when I exert force on the sign to make it go this way, I go that way. Well, actually, it's, it doesn't work as well because the sign isn't as heavy as I am. So wait, I have this over here. This is a, a barrel, and it has stuff in it, and it weighs as much as I do. OK, so watch. If I push on the barrel like that, I go away from it as much as it goes away from me. So. There you have it. Newton's. Newton's third. No, hold on. Newton's. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. Okay, go. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction.
So using a giant balloon to push me on a cart uh, didn't work. And I, ah! What happened? The plan now is to use the compressed gas cylinder. Just like a balloon, these cylinders contain a lot of air. If we get a cart and put a gas cylinder in a cage for safety on the back and open the valve, the escaping air might have enough force to push me. This is two cubic meters of air. If we were to put it in a balloon, the balloon would be this big. But if we compress the air, we can fit it all into one of these, a steel tank. This is what we're gonna be using next for our air-powered car. Got it? Yep. All right, Good. so Sarah and I have been hard at work and we've built the air-powered cart. We can't call it a balloon-powered cart anymore because now we've got a compressed air tank, so it's not a balloon that powers it. Exactly. Okay, so I'm gonna sit on here, Sarah's gonna turn on the tank, and I'm gonna go. And before we do this, we should say, do not, under any circumstances, try this at home. We are trained professionals. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, high five first. Okay, now we do it. Okay, so before I turn the tank on, make sure your feet are down and the brakes are on. Gotcha. Uh, Don't take them off till I say go. You have got it. All right. Ready. Okay. Yeah, it did work, but I feel I feel like it could work better. You want to go faster? I do want to go faster. This reminds me of the rock car. Yeah. Well, we didn't have a big enough balloon. And we need more force. We need more force. So should we get a bigger tank? Let's get more tanks. More, more tanks, more force. You're gonna go faster forward. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. High five. All right, let's do it. All right. Newton's Cradle, and it's a really cool toy that demonstrates all kinds of laws of motion, including Newton's third law. Newton's what you do is you pull this one ball out, and when it hits these balls, they exert force on that ball to make it stop moving, but it exerts force on these balls, which travels through the balls and makes this one in the end fly out, like that. Now, there's a lot going on here, but you can really see how the force is equal that you put in and you get out if you use two balls. I swing two balls up, and two balls go out that side. Isn't that cool? Now, it wouldn't be science max unless we maxed it out, so come on. Whoa! Okay, this is one we built out of bowling balls. Bowling balls. Bowling balls. <laughs> Instead of smaller balls, and I think it's gonna work the same way. Let's find out. You throw one out, and, and <laughs> yeah, it works the same. Okay, now let's try it with two balls. Okay, ready? Wait, 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 wait. And two balls, throw them out. And two balls on that side. All right, so there you have it. Whoa. Newton's third law. Oh. Ah. Newton's ah. third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So our single pressurized tank created enough force to move me, but not very fast. The plan now is to do two things. First, we're going to triple the amount of thrust by using three tanks. We're also going to use some pipes that lock into each other to give me an initial push. These pipes slide together, and when the air is turned on, the pressure in the pipes will cause them to slide apart, which will push me forward. After that, I use what's left in the tanks to keep going. All right, now it's time to max it out. I've enlisted the help of a few more Science Max people. Thank you very much, Corey. You'll see now we have three tanks of compressed gas, and we've also got this nifty little contraption. How does this work, Sarah? All right, so each tank is attached to a tube, yeah. and you can see that each tube goes into this one main tube, so when we turn them on, pressure's gonna build up, and we're gonna go forward with more force. Well, that's great, and Reed is stacking cinder blocks. Thanks, Reed, uh, up so that will push uh, the pipe will push against the cinder blocks, and then I'll go that forward. way. All right, well, are you guys ready? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Now, again, I have to say, thank you, Corey. I've got it. 
This is something you definitely don't want to try at home. We are all trained professionals. We have a physics degree here. We've got TV people that make sure that this is safe. So uh, watch it and enjoy, but please don't try any of this at home. Okay, I'm ready. Sarah, count me down. Three, two, one. Uh oh! Uh oh! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome! That was really awesome! All right, high fives! High fives! Yeah, 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 yeah! <laughs> and it's raining now, so it looks like we're gonna have to stop. So thank you very much for joining us on Science Max Experiments at Large in our episode on Newton's Third Law. Ha! Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large, and this is a syringe. You might know syringes from when you get a needle at the doctor, but syringes are used all the time in science because they let you measure very precise amounts of fluid. Now, check it out. You push the plunger down, and it comes out the top. Or you could pull the plunger in, and it would suck more fluid in this way. But check this out. I've got a syringe attached to a hose here, and this hose is filled with water. And I wondered, if the hose was really, really long, how hard would it be to push this plunger down? Of course, I don't know where the end of the hose is because it was really long and I had to string it all the way around, so. Ah, ha, 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 here it is. Okay, so let's find out. Push the syringe down and water will come out the other end of the hose. Pretty cool. You see, this is called hydraulics. Hydraulics is a branch of science that deals with fluids, fluids like water but hydraulics are also a mechanism used in a lot of machines. Check this out, this is a syringe with a short hose on it, much shorter this time, and I press down on the plunger of the syringe and water comes out. And I pull in on the syringe and water goes back in. Because the plunger is airtight, it allows me to push or pull the water. But what if I close the system and take another syringe and attach it to the end of the hose like this? Well, then, if I push this plunger in, this syringe fills up with water. And then I pull this plunger out, the syringe empties. So check it out, this plunger raises and lowers based on what I'm doing with this plunger. And you know what that means? We've made a remote control. Huh? Check it out. So, if you take two syringes, and you take a hose, and you attach them to something you want a remote control, voila, you can build something like this. We have made our very own robotic arm that you can power remotely with hydraulics. Pretty cool, right? If you want to build one of these yourself, here are the materials you need. First, you need two supports and the arm. I used pieces of wood, but you can use wooden spoons, rulers, or pencils. You'll need some craft sticks, elastics, and a paper plate. And of course, two syringes and a hose, which you can get in an art supply store or a hardware store. Here's how you build your own hydraulically powered arm. First, make the base by tracing holes for your supports the width of a craft stick apart. Cut out the holes and use a craft stick and elastic to secure the supports underneath the plate and on top. Then add some elastics and a piece of craft stick in the middle so the supports won't scrunch together. Because we are holding this whole thing together with elastics. Then get your syringe in there and keep it propped up with more elastics. Then get your arm and slot it in between the supports. The arm should be horizontal when the syringe is half full. Elastics to attach the arm and the syringe. Then push down on this end of the plunger and, ha ha, you have a remote control robotic arm. You can also max it out even more by adding more degrees of movement. You can make the arm rotate side to side. You can even add a little claw attachment at the end and power it all using syringes. Haha, <laughs> science and hydraulics. So let's max it out. I just, I just need an expert to help me. Uh, let's see. And over in that way. Uh, oh, Chris from Logics Academy, of course. Logics Academy knows all about building robot stuff. I'm sure Chris can totally help me. Let's go. Uh -huh. Oh, hey, Phil. Oh, hey, Chris from Logics Academy. Great to see you. What uh, took you so long? Uh, how long was I gone? And what's with the uh, orange lab coat? Oh, it happened again. It keeps changing the color of my lab coat, but this time, Chris, I prepared for it, and I wore another lab coat! <laughs> uh, See? Blue? No! 
Well, you know what? This is happening a lot, Chris. So, so I wore another lab coat <laughs> under this lab coat. I'm gonna have to wear a lot of lab coats though because this is happening all the time. We should talk about hydraulics, okay, right? Yes, yeah, because yes. we got some cool stuff planned. Okay, so we're just gonna get the table in here. Whoa, okay. This is the cool. hydraulic arm. Check it out. Oh, very cool, very cool. If we wanna max it out, what can we do? We can make it bigger, what, we can make it What if we arm. did it so that the force you put on this side gets multiplied so that this side's even stronger? Ooh, what do you call that when that happens? A uh, force multiplier. A force, I like that. Force multiplier, it sounds like a video game. So we would have a lot more power. You have a lot more power, which Ooh. we could do fun stuff. Yeah, so if we had like lots of power, what would we do? We'd like crush something. Yeah, let, let's crush some stuff. Yeah, we could crush some stuff. Okay, can we start with syringes though? Yep, yep. And then we'll work up as we go. I like it. So what do we need? Do we need different sizes? So yeah, I was thinking we need a small Mmm, a delicious plate of cheese and crackers, my favorite snack. But these crackers are pretty salty, so I should probably pour myself a glass of water first, huh? Yeah. No, my cheese and crackers! Why, why does this happen? Why does the water stick to the glass? Well, because of science. And the reason why it happens gets a little complicated, but it boils down to this one simple thing. Water likes to stick to things. Huh? huh? Did you see? Did you see how it's stuck? No, of course you didn't. You know why? Because it only sticks on a small scale. See those drops of water? That's water sticking to the surface. But it only works when the surface tension of the water is less than the force of gravity, which is why water drops fall when they get bigger. So it sticks to things. That still doesn't explain why you can pour water out of some containers without any drips, and other containers make it nearly impossible. <laughs> It's all about the angle. Water will flow very easily when there isn't a large change in direction, like around the curved top of this glass. But when there's a big change in direction, like at the mouth of this teapot, the water can't make that turn as easily. This is also why pouring from a full glass is much messier than one that's less full. Pouring out of a full glass, the water only needs to change direction this much to flow down the side. But from a half full glass, the water would need to change direction this much. So all this happens because water likes to stick to things. So let's do an experiment and coat this glass with hydrophobic spray. Now, hydrophobic coatings repel water. So if it's repelling the water from the outside of the glass, will we still have the same problem? Well, let's find out. Hydrophobic coated glass, non-hydrophobic coated glass, or just regular glass. Water likes to stick to surfaces, but it can't stick to one coated in hydrophobic coating. That's impressive. Should we try something else? Well, that's one way to solve the dribbling glass problem. Except you can't coat your glasses at home with hydrophobic coating because it's not good to eat. The secret is using a container that has a very sharp angle between where you're pouring the water and the underside of the glass, like this jug. And there you go. Now I can enjoy a nice glass of water with my cheese and crackers. Uh, oh, right, I am. Um, wait, hold on, I can re, I will remake the crackers into, see, look, see, it's just, it's fine. It's fine, I'm not really gonna eat that, I'm just kidding. Chris and I are maxing out our hydraulic crusher. Yes, yes, before we get to that, I have a little game I wanna play. Okay, great. Okay, you can pick either the small one. The big or one! Bigger. Okay. <laughs> so what's the game? Simple thumb war, uh, I'm gonna press down on this side, you press down on that side, we'll see who wins. Okay, okay ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go! <laughs> Oh, wow, that was really tough. Why was that so hard? Well, Phil, I'm just really strong. Wait a minute, my turn. Okay, one, two, three, go. Yeah, see, pushing down on this one is way easier. You wouldn't it think is. that the small syringe would be easier. Why is that? The reason for it is, is that you have to push this one down a lot farther than you have to push this one down. Okay, see? see? See how oh, far yeah. this one goes and this one's barely This one moving? travels. Much more. This is how we can exchange a little bit of force over a long distance. That's right. To a, a little bit of distance at a lot of force. That's exactly right. Just like the lever, it's a mechanical advantage. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's hydraulic advantage. That's right. Chris and I push down on small syringes, which gives us more force on our larger syringes. Our crusher was ready to go. Ooh, how about an orange? One, two, three. We squeeze down and... Oh! Oh! <laughs> then we tried a walnut. Are you allergic to nuts? I am not. One, two, three. Oh! 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 
When we tried a golf ball, we reached the limit of what our plastic syringes and our hands could do. We need to come up with a stronger, more awesome crushing machine using hydraulics. That's right. I have some ideas. Okay, good. We can go to we can use metal. We can use metal. And we can and use... we can go bigger as well. Ew, this water is gross, but I'm going to drink this water. Why? Well, because of science. No, but I'm not going to drink the water like this. First, I'm going to use the power of science to help me clean it. How? By using gravel. Gravel? Yes, gravel. So, say I've got some dirty water, and there are particles floating in that water. Large particles, your rocks, your wood. These styrofoam bits will act as the large particles. You pour it into the gravel, and the large particles get filtered out. See? Nothing but clean, clean water. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, Phil. That's not really clean yet. That's because we haven't done step two. Sand. Sand? Yes, sand. Let's say that these plastic beads are small particles. That filters out the tinier stuff. There. Huh? Clean, right? Uh, no, it's not very clean. So we filter the water in the next step with charcoal. What? Charcoal? Yes, charcoal. Charcoal works just like gravel and sand, except on a microscopic scale. Say these bits are tiny particles you can't even see. The charcoal catches these like the sand and gravel caught the larger particles. This is called a gravel, sand, and charcoal filter. The gravel catches the big particles, the sand the smaller ones, and the charcoal the microscopic ones. These kinds of filters are used all over the world to clean drinking water. Ah. Delicious. Science. Max Historica. This is Archimedes. What? Who said that? Uh, it's me, the narrator. We're doing a segment. Oh, well, I was working. Don't sneak up on a guy like that. Uh, <clears throat> this is Archimedes, an ancient inventor and one of the greatest scientific minds ever. Ooh. <laughs> One of his famous inventions was the Archimedes screw. Ooh, um, um, mm. ah. <laughs> Which was used to make holes in wood. No, that's not what it's for. It's, it's for water. Uh, right. Used to make holes in water. What, what, what? No. Look, did you even do your homework? I, um... Hold on. It's, uh... Yeah. It's, here, it's here somewhere. Ah. Um, Look, I'll just show you. You see, in ancient times, we had many uses for something that could lift water up from a well or to take lake water uh, from uh, the lake and put it into a farmer's field and that sort of thing. Ah, OK. I've got it from here. So Archimedes invented a screw and he drilled a hole in the side of that container. No. No, no. Uh, look, just just sit down. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll explain it, okay? I am sitting. I'm in a voiceover booth. Good for you. Now be quiet. Now look. What you do is you put the screw in the water like this, and then you want to raise the water higher, you see? And so turn it around like so, and the water fills each gap in the screw, and it starts to come up. It gets to the top, and look at this. Look, we've got water coming at the top there. The water is being pumped. Up. It is the first water pump. I see. Still seems like a lot of work to fill a glass, but it's very cute. No, we made them bigger. We obviously were not going to make them this big. This is not very useful. Uh, this right. Is yeah. Archimedes, one of the greatest scientific minds <laughs> ever. Ah. Chris and I are maxing out a hydraulic crushing machine. We tried one out of plastic, but now it's time to make one out of metal. These are called hydraulic cylinders, and they work the same as our syringes. Small ones on this side with a lot of travel, and then a larger one on this side to multiply the force. And some mechanical advantage with a lever to help us push even harder. We tried crushing a watermelon, and it worked great. So what else do we want to crush? We crushed a coconut. It's cracking. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh it's going to leak. And then a can of pop. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> Science Max Cola, now in the new smaller can. Let's really challenge this press. Ah, ha, ah, perfect. Ah, a piece of wood. We tried to crush the wood, but we weren't able to get it to budge. 
So it's time to max it out even more. I think we're gonna need like a multi-story industrial sized hydraulic press. You know where we can get one of those? I do. Awesome. This is water. Things float on water like pool noodles and wood and toy boats. And now we're gonna do an experiment with how paint floats on water. How's this supposed to work again? Oh! I'm supposed to take the paint out of the can first. This is a fun experiment you can do at home. All you need is a container, some water, and paint. But not just any paint, special paint you use for hydro dipping. That's hydro, meaning water, and dipping, meaning dipping. Carefully pour the paint on the water and add a few different colors. Then take a stick to swirl it up into a pattern. Then you get something you want to paint, and you carefully put it in like so. But don't pull it out as soon as you get it in. You have to spread the paint away because it'll stick when you bring it back out. And then when you pull it out, whoa, hydro dip. Let that dry, and then you have a very cool painted toy. Let's do some other stuff. This is a bike helmet. If you put tape on what you're painting, you can remove it later to make parts that aren't painted. Skateboard! Whoa! <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. Now to max it out. Hydro dip pants! Wearing the pants when you do this is super messy and not something you should try at home. But the results weren't bad. <laughs> Science pants! Science pants! Science pants. One of the ways you can experience the power of water is watching it wash away dirt. You can experiment with this yourself by making your own erosion table. To make your own, fill a plastic tub with sand and tilt it up. Cut a hole in the tub at the low end and put a hose with a trickle of water at the high end. Then to complete your model, fill it with a little happy town. This small model shows how rivers cut their course to the ocean by following the lowest point. Try to design your town and the layout of the ground so the river goes around the buildings. I'll see you later. I'm gonna take a swim in the river now. There are lots of ways to experiment. Change the amount of water or the steepness of the angle. Look at the soil, it's all getting eroded over here. Or the way the town is laid out. Every time you do it, the river goes in a different direction. And have fun. Oh, phew, I'm, I'm tired, I'm just gonna lie down. And that is the power of water. Chris and I are maxing out a hydraulic crushing machine. What about this? Is this what we're gonna use? We went to the Natural Resource Canada's CanMet Materials Laboratory, which is a federal research lab. Oh, this is good. Oh, look at that! Oh, could, is this what we're using? Uh, no, oh, oh I actually, can use this. Hold on, let me figure this out. Maybe, maybe later. What, really? Yeah, it's, it's just over here. CMAT is the largest research center in Canada dedicated to metals and materials research. This is it. This oh, is yeah, it. All right! Hydraulic press. How much force does this apply? This can do two million pounds. That's over 900,000 kilograms. Which is about 20 cars. <laughs> Let's crush some stuff! Let's get some stuff. Oh, crushing! We gotta get the stuff. We gotta get the stuff. Okay. We started out with the piece of wood which defeated our last press. And go! Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> I love that sound. It turned our wood into a pancake. Whoa, totally flattened. So it was time to try some other stuff. We crushed a ball of plasticine. <laughs> that is neat. You sort of made a rainbow. Yeah. Aluminum foil. Aluminum foil. Yes, it is now a solid plate of aluminum. <laughs> and a basketball. Basketball. Good thing we got these earplugs in because when it pops, it'll be loud. What? Never mind. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> this hydraulic press was so maxed out, we had to think of the toughest stuff to crush. We crushed hockey pucks, a safe, We crushed a hydraulic jack with the hydraulic press. 
This is a metal vice. Hard, strong. Yeah, steel. Heavy, steel. Whoa, look at this bed. Crush a bowling ball. <laughs> it totally exploded. <laughs> Science facts, experiments at large, hydraulics. Whoa. Nicely done. So fun. I should reverse it and we should start cleaning all that stuff up, yeah, huh? I think so. Okay, reverse. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and today we're talking about friction. I didn't slide. Take two. I can't, I'm still not. Oh, I, I know, I know. I got it. Take three. Oh, socks don't work any better. Take 15. <laughs> 34. Take 36. I don't know why I thought that would work. Take 52. I'm Phil, and today we're talking about friction! Oh. Sorry, sorry, okay. Oh. <laughs> friction! We did it! We got it, everybody! How many takes was that? Oh. Well, still, we got it. Good work. <laughs> As you may have already guessed, today is about friction. And here's a really easy friction experiment you can do at home. All you need is a piece of wood. You don't need the frame and you don't have to uh, do anything fancy to it. Just put one end up on a couch or a coffee table and make a nice ramp. Then you want something to slide down that ramp. And I like to use a piece of wood. Now check it out. Wood ramp, wood block. The friction is so much that the wood slides to there. Now what I like to do is take a little flag and mark the results. Recording the results is good science. Now here's where it gets fun. Get another surface and attach it to the wood, like carpet and wood. Let's see how far this goes. Hmm, not as good. All right, record the results. Cardboard. Ooh, nicely done, cardboard. Foam. And this wood has been waxed, like on a floor wax, which makes it nice and slippery. Let's see how that does. Ooh. And now the ultimate ice attached to wood. This is actually harder to do than I thought. All right, let's try it out. Not a big surprise right there. And get this, once you've done all of that, you can change the surface of the ramp. You can go to waxed wood, carpet, foam, cardboard. But, and, and well, yeah, you get the idea. Record all the results, compare them, and there you go. Friction ramp experiment. And that's what we're gonna be maxing out today. So come on, let's go. Check it out, I've improved the portal interface. Watch this. <gasps> yeah, and then I can scroll through experts and oh, this is gonna be fun. And I've got my coordinates right there. Whoa, um, that's never happened. Okay. Sarah, from Mad Science, you're gonna help me max out friction! Yeah, friction! What do you think of my max out friction room? It's amazing, it's so wonderful. So how are we gonna max out friction today? In the lab, I had a ramp, and I had um, stuff with different surfaces on it. Oh, that's so cool. It's too bad you don't have it here. We could totally test that out. <laughs> I can bring it here. Awesome. I have a new app on my phone that talks to the portal. And let's see. And, ha, and, huh. Hmm. That's not there's what I, oh, hold, hold on, hold on. Okay, there we go, and, whoa. Uh, well, I can do this, I just, um, it needs an update. Yes. That's what the, yeah, oh, there, there we 
we go. It is. Okay. Perfect. So here we go. Amazing. The friction ramp. It's pretty simple. You just take, um, I've got blocks of wood with different surfaces. Amazing. And then you just slide them down the ramp. All right. So cool. Yeah. So what if, um, to max it out, what if this is us? We're a block of wood? No, I mean like we are on the block of wood oh. and then we can tr try changing the bottom. I guess a block of wood isn't the right thing to use though. Right, yeah. Maybe we could use like a, like a sled. Oh, yeah, okay, like a, right, uh, like a snow sled. Mm. That's a great idea. Okay, so yeah. we'll tell you what, I will portal in a sled for are us. Are you sure you want to portal it in? I'm sure, just okay. stand, just stand back okay. though. Okay. Ha! Ah, there we go. Max out friction slide! You ready, Sarah? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. All right. Sarah and I pushed each other around on the sled, which was fun, <laughs> but it was also tiring. It's, uh, it's pretty hard. This is, a uh, my turn. My turn. All right. Oh, yeah! Whoa, friction! Yeah, friction! Yeah! Yeah, friction! But we soon realized it'd be pretty hard to measure how much friction there was. You know how hard you were pushing? Like, I had no idea how hard I was pushing. A lot, but that doesn't really help in science terms, so. Exactly. What do we do? Well, with your first experiment, you used a ramp. Could we maybe put a ramp up in here? In here? In here, yeah. I guess. Uh... Then we can measure also how far we go so we know how much friction is being used. Right, so we have our control and then we have all the, just like the blocks. Exactly, just like the blocks. Okay, great. So we'll get the ramp, we'll get a bunch of wood, right. yes. we'll get some tools. Yeah. The case of the missing friction. It was rough all over in the big city. My toughest case yet and I felt like I was getting nowhere. Someone stole all the city's friction. And it was my job to find out who and get it back. But after a week, I was no closer to solving the case. It was hard to get anything done now that there was no friction. Uptown to downtown, people were sliding all over with no way to stop themselves. It was chaos. Chaos, I tell you. But if there was any detective that could solve the case, it was me. <laughs> but it's like my grandma always said, it's tough to follow leads if you can't sit in your chair. <laughs> Nothing stays put in a city without friction. And you never appreciate something till it's gone. The phone rang. Sure, I wanted to answer it, but it slipped through my grasp just like this case. The mayor was on the line. He wanted to know if I'd made any progress. But I felt I was going in circles. I, I'm a little... I'm gonna have to call you back, Mr. Mayor. Without friction, you couldn't do very much at all. It was going to be my toughest case yet. Sounds good. Sarah and I are maxing out a friction ramp. Step one, make a giant ramp. There, are we done? Hey, okay, I think so. We're done. But it proved a bit hard to lift up to the second floor. Fortunately, Sarah had an idea. Maybe we could use this crane. We use the crane! Yeah. Oh yeah, I've got a five ton crane at Science Max headquarters. Good thinking, Sarah. So we rigged it up and tried it out. The bonus was we could make the ramp any angle we wanted. Okay, time to get my helmet, because don't go any higher than that, because I don't have my helmet. And then we will start sliding down. All friction right, room! Friction. I got on the slide and Sarah lifted it up until I started moving. Ah! <laughs> and that allowed us to record our results. We're at two meters. Two, two meters. meters! Recorded. <laughs> First recording done, All now right. we switch it up. We tried it again with Sarah on the slide to see if she slid at the same height. And she did. Yeah. <laughs> now we have a way to record the results. The plastic sled went down the ramp at this height. Things with more friction will mean the mark is higher, and less friction will mean the mark is lower. So then, we tried it with... Cardboard! <laughs> cardboard! What did we get? And it was? A little over two meters. Meaning? Cardboard is a little bit less slippy than the plastic of the sled. All right. Ready for carpet sled? Good to go. Here we go. <laughs> oh, past two meters. Right. Oh, almost oh, three. Here we go, here we go. 
carpet had even more. Oh my gosh, we're going this side. Whoa. That was so cool. <laughs> that was exactly three. Then we tried foam. Coming up on two meters. All right, coming up to three. It won't go up any higher. And just like the wood block, the foam didn't slide at all. What if I like do this and then I slide? <laughs> <laughs> Right, so, um, friction sled uh, on foam, highest friction of all of the materials. Oh. oh, hello there. I, whoa. Uh, here's a fun science experiment you can do with science and friction together. Take two books. Put them on top of each other and pull them apart. Ooh, not too much friction. But if you take the books and you interleave some of the pages, maybe three or four parts, and try it again, pull them apart, they're a little harder to pull apart. That's because the friction for more pages touching each other actually starts to add up. So what if we were to take two books with a lot of pages and very carefully and meticulously take each page individually, one at a time, and overlay each one and go back and forth. These are two books completely shuffled together. The elastic band is actually just to hold the covers together. All right. So now the friction between all of these pages, when I try to pull it apart, makes it pretty much impossible. Now there's two things going on here. First of all, when you start to pull the books apart, the pages start to stick together because they squeeze together because you're pulling and they're squeezing. And the fact that there's so many pages sticking together, the friction builds up to a degree that is actually very impressive. But don't take my word for it, let's max it out. Here is another two books, elastic just to hold the covers. This one clamped to the wall, and I'm gonna pull this one. <laughs> Science, still don't believe me? Well, let's max it out some more. Two books, all the pages layered together, held together only by friction, suspended over a giant bat of slime. Now, <laughs> let's see how much faith I have in science. <laughs> Friction! Yeah! Okay! Okay, oh no! Okay, now to get down. Okay, hold on. And then. <laughs> Science! <laughs> that was close. I have used our maxed out friction ramp and compared the regular sled to cardboard and foam. What's next? We've waxed the bottom of this sled and we're gonna try a wax sled next. Wax sled! All right, here we go. All right. One meter. Oh boy. 1.5 meters. Whoa! Oh. Wax sled! Slipperiest yet, yeah. only 1.5 meters. That's awesome. Do we have anything that's more slippery? Yeah, we do. We have ice sled. Are you ready to try it out? So ready to try it out. Okay, let's do it. All right. And there we Whoa. go. Whoa. <laughs> that was so cool. And only 1.25 meters. Least amount of friction. Ice wins. Ice so wins. Mm. I think we should do something else to max this out, though. Maybe bringing it up a little bit more and, and yeah, using I, something with less friction. Wait, I have an idea. Um, yeah, okay, come with okay. me. <laughs> this 
This is a climbing frog. Why does he climb? Because of science. I pull on this rope, and then I pull on that rope, and I pull on that rope, and that rope, and he climbs up the ropes. And why? Well, because of friction. The secret is two straws. The straws are pointed away from each other at the bottom. This allows it to climb thanks to friction. Take a closer look. When I pull on one string, it pulls straight, which makes the frog pivot. That string slips through the straw because there's not a lot of friction. But there's lots of friction on the other side because of the angle. So one side of the string goes down, which makes the other go up, which means the frog goes up with it. All thanks to friction. So now, let's max it out. This is a super maxed out uh, climbing frog. Just like the small version, I have a rope going through two tubes. I pull on one rope and the other holds on by friction. Then I switch. And it does work. It's just a lot harder to pull on the ropes. Uh, but it totally works. Whoa, guess what? There, and then this one, and then that one, and then that one. Yeah! <laughs> a giant climbing frog! <laughs> <laughs> All because of friction. Here's another way to defy gravity using friction. Get a plastic water bottle and fill it with rice. Take two. So get a plastic water bottle and fill it with rice using a funnel. Then take a shish kebab skewer and stick it into the bottle and nothing happens. <laughs> but if you tap the bottle down, the rice starts to pack in a little bit better. See how the level of rice is lower? Which means you can add more rice. Pack it down even more. And you can even use something the same diameter as the mouth of the bottle, like, say, a highlighter. And make sure all the rice is as packed in as you can get it there. Now the rice is really packed in there. And when I stick the shish kebab skewer in, the friction between the pieces of rice and this wood is enough to lift the bottle using nothing but friction. Now, let's max it out. I filled this 20 liter water cooler jug full of rice and it's really, it's really heavy. I wanted to see if I could lift it using nothing but friction and this dowel, which is just a round piece of wood. All right, here we go. Ah, <laughs> science! I'd max it out even more, but I don't think I could lift anymore. It's okay, I could just fit. Um. Newton's first law in 60 seconds. Newton's first law says an object in motion tends to stay in motion. So, why don't they? See, if I was to throw this, it doesn't stay in motion, it doesn't keep going, it slows down and falls to the ground. Well, the whole law states an object in motion tends to stay in motion until an external force acts upon it. So what forces are acting upon this? Well, gravity for one, pulling it down towards the ground, and friction, specifically air friction, slowing this down and making it stop. Now, if you were to have something very light with a lot of surface area, it would really be affected by air friction. You wouldn't be able to throw it very far at all, no matter how hard you tried. So there you go. Newton's first law, an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless it's affected by an external force such as friction, like air friction. So, there you go. Sarah and I have recorded a lot of results on our ramp by raising it till we started to slide. Here we go! Now we've decided to raise the ramp to the highest point and see how far we can go using some low friction things, like a wheeled cart. I've made a double bike cart. Wheels are great for moving. They have rolling friction, right? Which is different from sliding friction. Whoa! boxes back there. That was it. We went really far. Total fun. Let's try something else. So what are we going to do next? Now we're going to do the frictionless this thing that we have at Science Max headquarters, a hover disc. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Where did you
you get it? Built it, season one. Amazing. As you may remember from that episode, a hover disc uses air to greatly reduce the friction with the ground. Here we go. So what would a hover disc do on a ramp? Right. Only one way to find out. Let's recap. Friction is when two surfaces rub against each other. You can have a very small amount of friction or a very large amount, depending on the materials. And using science to reduce friction results in the best sledding experiences. Nicely done. Science, Max. Experiments at large. Your turn? My turn? Yeah, let's okay, do it. Okay, so take those and I'll get this yep. and then I'll give you the helmet. And then we gotta rebuild the... Rebuilding the boxes is like the hardest part yeah. of this whole situation. But. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we are using mouse traps, but I cannot find my mouse traps, so it's gonna be a little hard to do the experiment unless I have. Oh, hey, here they are. Oh yeah, I stored them preset. Why? Why would I do that? Okay, well that's that's fine. Anyway, today we, careful, are going to be using mouse traps. Uh, um, like I said, we are going to be using uh, <laughs> mouse traps. Mouse traps as a form of pr uh, propulsion. That's the force that makes things go. And we are going to be making a boat go. And what is the thing that's going to make this boat go? A mouse. Uh, oh. Oh, it's not set. Sorry, I'm really jumpy. Anyway, we're gonna be using a mouse trap. And don't worry, no mice are gonna be harmed in the making of this or any Science Max episode, but mouse traps are really great because they can store energy in the spring. If you see, there's a spring that makes this bar want to snap back, but we can put energy into the spring and store it and then use that energy as it unwinds the spring to propel our boat but it's a little more complicated than just this. So come on, I'll show you. What we're gonna do is build this. This is the mousetrap boat, and it works like this. I've got the mousetrap, and it's attached to a long arm. That arm has a string on it, and it goes around the paddle wheel, and as the mousetrap unwinds, the paddle wheel spins like that, which pushes the boat forward. Now, it looks kind of complicated, but it's actually quite simple to make, and here's what you need. My mousetrap boat is made with styrofoam, craft sticks, and elastics. You'll also want a pencil, plastic drink caps, a shish kebab skewer, small zip ties, string, and of course, your mousetrap. Now, mousetraps can hurt your fingers, so get an adult to help you when you use it. Start with two pieces of styrofoam. I like to cut mine into this shape, but the only really important thing is that they're the same size. Your paddle wheel is made from a circle of styrofoam with a pencil through the middle, and it will go across like this. To make the paddle wheel, I use cut pieces of craft stick, or they can be plastic, and make some cuts and then put them in like this, and that is what will make your paddles on the paddle wheel, because that's the wheel and that's the paddle. Paddle wheel. <laughs> that's why they call it that. Stick drink caps to the ends of the pencil after sticking it through the styrofoam. I like to use a few craft sticks and elastics to help give the styrofoam strength. Next is the mousetrap, which you want to glue down to a frame of four craft sticks. Attach the frame to the boat with elastics, then attach the shish kebab skewer or a pencil to the mousetrap with zip ties. I like to put some craft sticks on the end to make it easier to tie the string to it. Wrap the other end around the paddle wheel pencil, and remember you need enough string so that your stick can lie flat. Okay. Let's try it out. Wind up the paddle wheel. This will be a little hard as the spring will pull back, but that's where you're storing the energy. And when it's wound up, put it in the water and let it go. The paddle wheel turns because the mouse trap is transferring energy that we put in earlier, and it goes all the way. We stored the energy in the tension of the spring. Now that tension is pulling the mouse trap, the stick, and the string, which turns the paddle wheel and makes the boat go. Mouse trap powered boat! If you want more detailed instructions or other designs, look up Mousetrap Boat. And there you have it, the Mousetrap Powered Paddle Wheel Boat. And this is what we're going to max out today. Come on. All right, time to pick an expert and go off to max it out. Careful, okay. 
Let's see here. And, uh-huh. Who to pick? But, ah, Michaela from the Ontario Science Center. She'd be perfect. All right. Come on. Water again. Oh well, at least maybe Michaela made it. Ah! Oh, Michaela! Whoa, Phil! Are you okay? Are we still fixing the portal? Yeah, I oh, needed to tweak it just a little bit. It was a, <laughs> it's a little off again. Anyway, great to see you, Michaela, from the Ontario Science Center. You're gonna help me match up the mousetrap boat. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, where's the boat? I, yeah, I don't have it. it. I thought it was gonna come through the portal. Um, it could be anywhere, really. I mean, just... <laughs> what? Oh, here it is. Okay, good. So here is the mousetrap boat. Check it out. So, got a mousetrap here, right? And you wind up the paddle wheel. And it goes! Yeah, right on. Awesome. So, what do you think we should do in order to max this out? Uh, well, first idea, I'm just thinking more mousetraps. More mousetraps. So, we just make a boat and it has like 10 mousetraps on it. At least. Okay, great. Actually, I had mousetraps. I had mousetraps coming through the portal as oh, well. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, we're all right. Okay, so now we've got the mouse traps. We can start building. <laughs> Let's collect them carefully, though. I don't know if they're. <laughs> Initial thrust! Or oh, constant thrust! <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference? It's all about power! <laughs> uh oh. Paper airplane initial thrust! It gets all. It gets all of it. It gets all of its thrust from my throw. <laughs> Initial thrust. If you want constant thrust, you have to take the thrust with you, like this. There's a lot of cats in here. Initial thrust. Initial thrust. Initial thrust. All the energy is put into the beginning of the. All the energy is put into the beginning. If you want constant thrust, then the thing has to produce power while it's moving. Wind up car, constant thrust. Actual car? Yeah, that's constant thrust because you have an engine. Of course, not this car. This is this is a toy car. But but you know what I mean. Check out this fishing rod, and on it I have a lure with a hook. Now watch this. I cast it out, initial thrust. But then I use the reel and start winding it back in. Constant thrust, huh? Huh? Two thrusts in one. And now you know the difference between initial thrust and constant thrust. Hey! Huh, I caught a fish! Hey, hey! Oh, oh. Easy, kitty. Nice kitties. Easy, Ramona! <laughs> Michaela and I are maxing out a mouse trap boat. We built a larger version with 10 mouse traps all in a line. So it looks pretty good. I think we're ready, right? Yeah, I think so. We've got a whole bunch of mouse traps. Should we, should yeah. we wind it up and see right. what, what happens? Let's do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think this is going to go pretty well. What do you think of that stick? Is that going to bend too much? Is that going to snap? Or... It's pretty flexible. I mean, I think we're okay. I think we just keep going and, yeah. until it, it breaks. Ooh. Oh. Now it's starting to look very oh, fast. Man. Yeah, <laughs> like it looks like a speedboat. Okay, ready? Yes. Go. <laughs> hmm. Well, um, positive, it is working. It's not gonna win any speedboat races. <laughs> it is not, not gonna win any races at all. But it's totally working. The mousetraps, they're pulling on the string. The string is making the paddle wheel turn. Just not much. I would have thought this many mousetraps would be a little bit more effective. Yeah, it looks like we're going for, for distance over power things. See, oh, right, using because... A lever here. That's a lot of distance for this to travel. Small amount have... of force over a much longer distance, that's how a lever works. Exactly. So we slide the rope down further on the stick, then we would get more force, and it just wouldn't go as long. Okay, so why don't we try that? Wrapping like that. Nice. All right, once nice. again. Trial two. Okay. okay, ready? Ready, set, go! Ah! Oh. Hey, that was better than last. Oh, now it's picking up. Yeah, that's really working. Oh, oh, careful. oh look out! <laughs> oh, no. 
So, good. It's good. Hey. It's not great. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, we... Right? How do we make it better? What do you think? Well, I was thinking, what if we try to reduce the friction? Remember that other boat we tried? Uh, here it is. Oh, yeah. The little one, you mean? Yeah, the little one. See, look at this one. It has a pontoon style. Do you see how um, we have it floating on these two surfaces? Yeah. So very little is actually touching the water. Whereas oh. this one, we have a giant hull that's going to drag the water and slow our boat down. So it's, it's sort of like the difference between, like, like pushing a whole bunch of water like that and and pushing the water like that. Yeah, we want very little resistance for our boat. So little resistance with a couple things that just stick down like that. A lot of resistance when we have big, flat, big, like <laughs> exactly. that. So we completely rebuilt this boat. Shall we do it? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, our tools floated away again. Oh. Race ya. <laughs> Our maxed out mousetrap boat isn't the only way to give a boat propulsion. Let's look at another way using a balloon. Let's make a balloon powered boat. All you need for that is something to be your boat and a balloon. Then you attach them together. Actually, the best way to do it is use a straw and attach the balloon to the straw using an elastic band. And then you attach it to your boat using more elastic bands, just like this. I put a nice tape top on the boat to make it look awesome. And I also put a little bit of a riser here using just anything plastic to keep the straw nice and straight because the question is, will our balloon powered boat work better if it's pushing in the air or if it's pushing in the water? Well, let's do a science experiment and find out. First version in the air. <laughs> Oh, almost all the way. Now let's try it with the straw like this so it pushes into the water. Whoa! It works so much better. Why? Because water is denser than air. The air coming out of the straw has to push against something to make the boat move. Water has more mass than air, so pushing against water has a better result. Now, let's max it out. This is an air compressor. Well, actually, that is the air compressor. You see, the engine here pushes air into this tank, which works sort of like the balloon. And then it goes out this long hose, which sort of works like a straw. So let's make a maxed out air powered boat. Ready? Just like the small boat, pushing against the air doesn't produce much thrust. Huh, not so great. But now let's put it in the water. Pushing against the water gives me much more thrust because water is more dense than air. <laughs> Maxed out air powered boat! Maxed out air powered boat! Yeah! Whoa. That's, that's not me. Michaela and I are maxing out the mouse trap boat. Ten mouse traps didn't seem to make our boat go very fast, but moving the string down our lever arm helped, and now we want to redesign the hull so it has less friction with the water. Ah, <laughs> check it out! This is the ultimate mouse trap boat. We got ten mouse traps here. We got our long arm. We have it attached at the right point of the lever, we think, and then we've got two, two paddle wheels at the back and. Pontoons. Yes. Yeah, so what I do you think, Kayla? this Michaela? thing is set. It's gonna be awesome? Yep. Okay, ready? Ready? Let's test it. Oh, oh it's working! Hey, it's working! It's picking up speed! Yes? Wow! Whoa, mousetrap boat. I mean, it's good. It's good. It's not Science Max good. Yeah. Uh, we were hoping it would go faster. Faster no. or... No, pretty much just faster. <laughs> yeah, okay. Obviously, okay. we need to store more energy that will make the paddle wheels uh, go faster, right? Yeah, so we just have to think about it, right? Like, what's stronger than a mouse trap? Well, ten mouse traps. That's why we have ten <laughs> mouse traps, Michaela. Okay, what's what's stronger than ten mouse traps? Eleven mouse traps. <laughs> Look, if we just keep going, okay, and it's just gonna get super traps. wide, we have a thousand mouse trap wide. What's, what's, enough what? with the mouse traps. Have you ever seen like a rat trap? No. They're huge. Well, hold on. I can just get one from the portal. One rat trap coming up. Oh. Okay, okay, came from. All right, well that's fine. And whoa! Wow! Yeah, look at that, that is a lot bigger. Huge okay, so snap difference. yours. Is, All right, is it ready? Mouse trap. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's terrifying. So that's a lot more power. Yeah, a lot of force. Uh, so tell you what, we have a little mouse trap boat. 
why don't we build a little single rat trap powered boat and we'll race them and we'll just see the difference in, in power from one rat trap to one master. I like that. We'll do a prototype before we make a big one. Yeah, okay, come on, let's go. So we built a rat trap boat to race the mouse trap boat. And then Michaela and I got a little competitive. Check out the rat trap boat. No, oh, check out the mouse trap boat. Mouse trap boat is better because <laughs> Yeah, rat trap boat is better. It's got bigger springs, more potential energy stored in here. And, and mouse trap boat has less potential energy and less springs, but he's got more heart and he really wants to win. Hey, yeah, I'll tell you what, Phil. Loser jumps in the pool. What? Oh, um, uh, okay. Sure, let's do it. Okay, ready? Go! So, as you may have guessed, the rat trap boat has a lot more potential energy that can be stored in the spring. Okay, so, rat trap boat is clearly better than the mouse trap boat. We make the boat the same way, yeah. but we use rat traps instead of mouse traps. What do you say? I love it. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Wait a second, Phil. What? Ferris Fairy, gonna jump in the pool. Okay, fine. Here you go. Hold this. <laughs> Inertia, what is it? Well, it's directly related to Newton's first law of motion. An object in motion tends to stay in motion, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. Let's do an experiment. Here is an object, right now it's at rest. You might think that means it has no inertia, but that's not true. Inertia just means an object's tendency to keep doing what it is doing. Right now, it's doing nothing. But if I wanted to overcome its inertia, I would have to put energy in. And now that I have, it is moving on its own. It has inertia. If I wanted to stop it, I would have to overcome its inertia, its tendency to keep moving. There. I went exactly that far. Now, let's max it out. I'm adding uh, these weights to the cart. Now it has a lot more mass which means it has a lot more inertia and its tendency to do nothing. But this time it has a lot more inertia. If I wanted to get it going the same speed as before, I'd have to put in a lot more effort. There, now it's going the same speed as before, but now it has way more inertia, so stopping it will be harder. So there you go, inertia, a thing's tendency to stay moving or stay still, and the more mass, the more inertia. <sighs> Dear Phil, I can't believe you did a whole episode on boat propulsion and you didn't use the greatest thing out there for making a boat move, a propeller. Sincerely, a fan. Well, let's talk about propellers. Oh. Good thing this is fan mail. <laughs> Get it? Because it's a fan? Anyway. A fan pushes air just like a boat propeller pushes water. They're both fluids and they behave in the same way. Now, if you look closely at a fan, it's curved on the blades. The air or water is caught under at this side and then it's pushed out on the curve to make it go that way. And the faster it spins, the better it works. Now this is a propeller powered boat. And what you do is wind up the propeller. I have an elastic band here to store the amount of energy I put in. And then you put it in the water, the propeller spins, and the boat goes forwards. It's being propelled by the propeller. <laughs> That's why you call it that. Awesome, right? Well, now we'll max it out. This is a drill. It spins. And this is a propeller. And when you put it in the water and spin it, it provides thrust. So let's try it out. Whoa! Remember not to try this at home. I am a trained professional. This is a very small propeller. Let's compare. This, th this is a super maxed out propeller. Whoa, okay, let's try it out. Whoa! The larger a propeller is, the more energy you need to turn it. 
and the more propulsion you get out. Michaela and I are maxing out the mousetrap boat. Well, actually, we can't call it a mousetrap boat anymore because now we're using rat traps. <laughs> <laughs> the design is the same as our 10 mousetrap boat. Rat trap boat! Rat trap boat! Rat trap boat! It's the super most rat trap boat ever! We wind it up and try it out. Okay, ready? Go! It worked great. The reason is because this boat was storing a lot more energy in the spring tension. More energy means more propulsion. So much, we couldn't even catch it. Yeah! That was awesome! Rat trap boat! <laughs> Science Max, experiments at large, rat trap boat, high five. <laughs> Let's do it again. Hello, greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and I think I might have overdone it with the science. I mean, what's a better use of science than creating a whole bunch of slime? Well, I did, and you know what? It's really cool. <laughs> slime. I love slime. It always makes me feel like a mad scientist, but I need a good mad scientist laugh. <laughs> yeah, it needs work. Anyway, today we're talking about polymers. Polymers like slime. But you see, polymers aren't really a substance. They're more how something is constructed. And there's all kinds of different polymers. There's slime, obviously, and rubber polymers like, well, like rubber. And there's also hard polymers like plastic. Now, polymers are all kind of constructed the same way. Like this. This is a chain. Yeah, so imagine this is a chain of molecules and all the molecules are the same and they just repeat in a long line. Now, when you get a polymer like slime, all the chains are not connected or very loosely connected, which means that they can flow over each other like a slime or sort of like a liquid and they behave like that. So that is slime. But when you get to a rubber polymer, you start to get little bonds in between the chains of polymers that work like this. You see, they still move around a little bit, but they can, they can spread apart and they become flexible and bouncy. Yeah, I know, a chain, a chain doesn't really bounce, but rubber polymers do. Huh? Now, when it gets to a solid polymer like plastic, there's a lot more links and it's all kind of interconnected and it doesn't move at all. It doesn't move, okay, again, harder to tell with a chain, but plastic is very hard and rigid. So let's dive into the world of polymers and make some slime. <laughs> yeah, too mad, not enough scientist. I'll keep working on it. Anyway, to make slime, take your white glue and pour in uh, an amount. It really kind of depends on how much slime you want to make. Now, you want to add about twice as much water as that. Uh, yeah, somewhere around there, great. Now we want to put in just a little bit of soap. Mm -hmm, maybe there, that's good. And you want to put in your food coloring. I like green. Green seems like the right slime color to me. It's the right appropriate mad scientist kind of slime. And then you want to start mixing that up till you get the right kind of consistency. That means make sure the glue and the water are equally mixed up. Good. And now we're ready to make it an actual slime by bonding the polymers together by adding liquid starch. Mm -hmm. Very good. And you want to mix it up. When you add the liquid starch, it starts to bond the chains of molecules together, changing it from a liquid to a slime. It's coming along. And there you go. Slime. Now, if you want clear slime and not opaque slime, you want to use clear glue and not white glue. But that's basically the recipe. So there you go. Slime. <laughs> Too super villain? Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, we go. All right. Now all you need is an expert to help me max it out. Of course, my interface is hand gesture based, so I don't know if the slime. Oh, hey, there we go. Great. So, you get it. Uh huh. Uh, oh, of course. Sarah from Mad Science. Mad Science, they really know their slime. This is great. Okay, I got it. Close, close, close. Close. Hey, there we go. All right. Ugh. I'm not sure bringing it through the portal is such a good idea, but at least I'll have it on the other side. 
I have a pot. Why do I have a pot? I didn't have a pot when I went through the portal. Is someone somewhere missing a pot, or did it just create this pot out of nothing? Huh. <laughs> hey, hey, Sarah. Hey, hi. How are you doing? Good. Sarah from Mad Science, you're going to help me make some slime. Yes, I actually brought some. Oh, this isn't this isn't slime. This is a pot lid. Hey. Oh. oh. Well, uh, at least we have a set. Doesn't answer any questions, though. And I guess we're going to have to make some more slime. Definitely. What kind of slime do you want to make? Uh, what do you mean, what kind? Is there more than one kind? Oh, yeah, there are tons of different kinds of slime with lots of different ingredients and recipes. Oh, I only know the one. Can you show me all the others? Of course. Let's go make some right now. Okay, great. Awesome. Come on down to Sal's Science Shop and see me, Sal, while you shop for science. This week only, Sal's one-of-a-kind, once-a-year polymer sale. 50 to 75 percent off anything made of polymers. Rubber? That's a polymer. Polystyrene. When you're eating your next meal, I recommend some polypropylene. Low-density polyethylene. High-density polyethylene. You want some polytetrafluoroethylene? We got it. We've even got polychlorotrifluoroethylene. Do they even know how good a deal this is? Cause you're not gonna find, you're not gonna find that kind of deal just like every day. But hold the phone. Polymers aren't just plastics. Rayon, nylon, Teflon, you name the lawn, we got it on. Sale. What, what do, do we, we want? want? Polymers. When, when do we, we want them? them? Anytime during normal business hours. Wool, silk, even cotton. Polymers, polymers, polymers. Polymers, polymers, polymers. Word has lost all meaning. Glue, paint, umbrella fabric, oh yeah. Carpet, you bet that's on sale. Roberta, I'm running out of sale signs. Buy it and I'll put it in a plastic bag, also made of polymers. Seriously, Roberta, we can't have a sale on everything. Oh, hey, hey, even you, even me, the proteins in our bodies, even our DNA, all polymers. <laughs> so come on down to Sal's Science Shop and get a great deal on your polymers for a limited time. I mean, it'd have to be a limited time, right, Roberta? Because, I mean, I can't discount everything in the store to 75% off. How am I going to make any money? I mean, are we still rolling? One hundred different kinds of slime. Yes, it's gonna be so much fun, but we're not gonna make a hundred today. Yeah, I know. We're just gonna do our top favorites. Yeah, it's gonna be super great. All right, what are we starting with? So our first slime we're starting with today is some really cool molding slime. Now this slime, actually, if you leave it out overnight, it'll harden, and you can make an imprint of whatever you like. So here we made an imprint of our little uh, tool there. So we're gonna look at a little bit more liquidy slime, starting with this one over here, which I believe you already know about. This is cornstarch mud. Exactly. You hold this. Sounds good. I'm gonna good. hold this and we're gonna try pouring it. Whoa. Oh, Whoa. so. See, it's like, it's like a liquid, but then you can do it fast, it's like a solid. All right, what's next? Over here, we have some other really awesome types of slime. So right over here, we have some crunchy slime. Crunchy slime? Exactly. Why is it crunchy? Now, it's crunchy because we've actually added a few beads inside of it to make it crunchy. Uh -huh. so this is some really cool, awesome slime. Here, you take half. And you can feel the beads as you get to stretch it out. It's so cool. This is uh, this one is a little harder to clean. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I'll just do that. All right, so what's next? So next we have some really cool glow-in-the-dark slime. Glow-in-the-dark slime? Yeah, it's so awesome. Ooh, look at how much it glows. That glows a lot. That's super glowy slime. So to do the different kinds of slime, we need the polymer. Yes. And then the thing that sticks the polymers together. Exactly. So the glue is the polymer. Glue is the polymer. And the starch is the thing that bonds it. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Very cool. And then you put the thing in that makes it the, the kind of slime. Yes, right before you add the bonding component, because if we keep uh, adding stuff after it's already made, it unfortunately won't be able to take it. So we add our powder before we add our starch in this situation. Uh, should we go on to the next thing? <laughs> yeah, let's move on to the More slime. slime. Plastic is great, and plastic is everywhere. But the problem with plastic is it isn't very biodegradable. It, it doesn't break down in the environment. <laughs> I'm still on hold. Oh, well, there you go. Back for another couple years, I guess. But here's a way that you can make bioplastic. It's fully biodegradable because it's made of natural materials. The recipe is easy. Two parts cornstarch, three parts water. 
a few drops of cooking oil, and some food coloring to make it whatever color you want. Purple, science purple. Mix it up and it turns into a paste. Now what you'll need are two things. One, an adult, and two, a microwave. Put it in for 30 seconds. Clock wipe. There we go. Then take it out and mix it some more until it cools down. Then you can pull it out and use your hands to sculpt it into a shape or take the shape of something else. Once you put it all the way around, you can turn it into a little flower pot. Once you've sculpted it, you need to wait for it to dry, which will take about a day. Clock wipe. After waiting a day... Uh, <clears throat> huh? Uh, what? It's been a day? Oh. You have something made out of bioplastic. Like this little flower pot you can use to grow a small plant. And then when it grows big enough, you can take this biodegradable flower pot and plant it right outside in the dirt, and this pot will biodegrade and turn back into dirt. Pretty cool, right? Well, let's max it out. Biodegradable Frisbee! Check it out! It's a Frisbee, but it's biodegradable. So you throw it around in the park, but if you lose it, it turns back into dirt. <laughs> What, not enough? Okay, clock wipe! Biodegradable lawn chair! Use it for one season and then return it to the earth afterwards. I think this is one of my best science max. I... Okay, bioplastic lawn chair not as strong as regular lawn chair. We've learned that lesson now, so that's that's good to know. I mean, I mean, how would I have known if I hadn't tried it? Sarah and I are looking at different recipes for slime. All right, what do we got here? So over here we have some amazing foamy slime which has so, so many ingredients in it. Here, watch what happens when we start pulling it out. Ooh, wow. So it's like... Super stretchy Whoa. and super fluffy. Here, that's great. Okay, now we gotta, you gotta hold yours. You gotta hold this in. Okay, you take, and then take some more. And then we take that. And then, yeah. <laughs> It gets thinner and thinner and becomes more and more lines of foamy slime. Yeah. And the last kind of slime we made today is some classic flubber slime. Woo! So much fun. Now, why do you think it's called is it flubber slime? Because it's, is it really a slime? It is a slime, yeah. It's super fun and it's oh. super stretchy. Oh, okay, I get it. Look, look at that, and it's sort of like, like a little bit like gelatin. It is almost like gelatin. Here, you can have some. There you go, whoa. Oh, ha, ha. Uh oh. All right, so Sarah, now what we need to decide mm -hmm. is how we're gonna max it out. Right. Like, should we just get a lot of slime? That sounds like a really good idea, but we are gonna need something to put it in, because we can't just have slime all over the floor. Okay, you're right. So we'll get we'll get some sort of container thing. Yeah. And we'll see how much slime we can make, and then we'll just play with it and see what happens. Sounds good. And yeah, we will experiment, because it's science. Yeah. Okay, hi. High five. Careful high five so we don't splatter. Okay, good. Okay, let's go. This is it. This is a rubber glove. Well, actually, it's a latex glove. What's the difference? I will get to that in a second. But I'm sure you can agree, it's super stretchy. How stretchy? Let's fill a rubber glove with water and see how big it gets. <laughs> so. Difference between latex and rubber. Well, it all comes from a rubber tree. Well, actually it's a fake tree. It's just to show you how it works. The sap of the rubber tree is collected just like this. There's a spigot and then the sap goes out and it's collected. It's the same way that the sap for our maple syrup is collected. And this, this is natural latex. If it's dried out, it becomes natural rubber. Latex generally means the liquid form and rubber means the solid form. But wait, then why is this a latex glove? <laughs> the glove is not liquid, what's the deal? Well, generally latex means water-based or liquid, like latex paint, but it could also mean synthetic latex. That's latex that's man-made and doesn't come from a rubber tree. So, we call rubber gloves rubber gloves because they used to come from rubber trees, but now they're usually made out of man-made latex. But either way, they're super stretchy. I wonder how big this is gonna get. Ha 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 ha! 
<laughs> Science! Sarah and I are maxing out polymer slime. How? Maxed out tub of slime! Whoa! Okay, so how do you feel? Is it, uh, are we mixed up enough? First, we mix up a bunch of slime in a garbage bin. So with the polymer chemistry, the polymer is generally a liquid, right? Yep. And the bonding agent makes it stick together. So the more we use, the more of a solid we get. Exactly, yeah. So we want to split it and make it sort of halfway between a liquid and a solid, and I think we're exactly at the right stage. It looks perfect. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's dump this garbage can in. All right. All right. Then we dump it in. <laughs> oh, bro. It turns out we needed more slime. Um, I don't think that's going to be enough. I think we might need some more slime. Yeah, how much more do you think we need? So, we added 11 more. Ah, delicious. Last one. Oh, yeah. Then we experimented. Oh, oh, yeah. We have a giant, giant tub of slime. <laughs> because the slime is stretchy, it created amazing bubbles. So do you think I could blow a bubble with the slime? Well, do maybe I, not you, but definitely the air compressor. This? No, either, uh, no, I'd have to just put it on my face. I think yeah. I've already got it on my face. Then there was only one thing left to do. We get in this line. Can we do that? We can totally do that. This is Science Max. That's so exciting. <laughs> going swimming in slime. Yes. Who's going first? You are. I am, obviously. All right, this is how Science Max does polymers. Three, two, one. <laughs> Plastic is everywhere, but what can we do with it aside from recycle it? Well, we can reuse it to make cool plastic charms. But you're gonna need the right kind of plastic, and you need polystyrene. Just look for the little number six inside the recycle symbol. Cut out some plastic and decorate it however you want. There we go. Haha, <laughs> check it out. The Science Max logo. Also, I've made a couple other things. I've got a chemical symbol, an atom, and this is me in some slime. Then get an adult to help you put it in the oven or toaster oven at 350 degrees. It only takes a few seconds for the plastic to shrink to one third its size. The reason why this happens is when plastic is manufactured, it's heated and stretched out and then cooled, and it sort of freezes in that stretched out shape. And when you reheat it, it shrinks back down to the unstretched shape. Get your adult to take it out and wait for it to cool, and you'll have yourself some small plastic designs you can use for keychains, bracelets, name tags, bookmarks, whatever you want, all using the power of polymers. Awesome, I'm gonna make all of those. What was that again? Keychain, ornament, magnet. Um... Magnetic putty in 60 seconds. This is magnetic putty. Thank you. This is magnetic putty. Ten take. This is magnetic putty. 26. This is magnetic putty. 2,635. This is, yes, this is magnetic putty. I can't count this high. This is magnetic putty. <laughs> magnetic. Oh. oh, it's not a magnet. It's attracted to magnets. Oh, that makes more sense. This is magnetic putty, and this is a magnet. The putty is made of polymers, which means it can flow over itself. It also has lots of iron filings in it, which is why it's attracted to magnets. This is what happens over several minutes. And there you go, magnetic putty. Okay, so where were we? Oh yeah. Three, two, one, yeah! And remember, don't try this at home. Ah! and I enjoyed our maxed out tub of slime. So let's recap. 
Slime is made of polymers. Polymers come in a lot of different forms. It's all about long chains of molecules. And none are more fun to swim in than slime. Do I have slime hair? Ooh, yeah, definitely. Slime hair! Oh, slime! <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Science Max experiments at large. Polymers. Slime. Yeah. High fives. Yeah. Slimey high fives.